welcome. Today I'm going to talk to you about a few of my favorite hemes. And I'll explain what a heme is in a second. This is a re-recording of a talk that I gave on March 13th, 2021 um, in um, Second Life at the Science Circle. I decided to re-record the talk because there were sound issues in the original recording. Um, and today I'm uh, hosted on um, the chemistry world region of Second Life. So it's very close to uh, the original venue. So I always include an abstract with my talks. You can read that at will. The abstract is also in the PDF of the talk, which is available from the Science Circle website. I'd like to start with some acknowledgments. Of course, Science Circle, uh, they've been um, supporting talks for uh, many years now, um, over a decade, uh, many of which are uh, recorded and posted on YouTube. I'd um, particularly like to uh, thank the National Science Foundation for uh, support for my own research, as well as, um, as part of that support for uh, the Science Circle. My research students, of course, uh, my uh, good friend and collaborator, Dr. George Richteradu, um, uh, who is my collaborator on the NSF. Um, also like to thank support from um, Southern Illinois University Edwardsville and everyone for coming um, and um, continuing to support the uh, Science Circle and uh, Second Life. So without further ado, today's talk. Well, I'm gonna talk about what HEME is in case you don't know. Uh, and uh, heme is a part of uh, many proteins that uh, manage peroxide um, or transport oxygen or make nitric oxide or a variety of other useful functions in the body. And I'll go over and talk more about some specific proteins, hemoglobin, myoglobin, a little segue about how we know structure, and then I'll talk a little bit more about some selected proteins such as cytochrome P450 and uh, neuronal nitric oxide synthase. So what is heme? Well, let me zoom in to a heme nitric oxide. Um, model. So uh, this is a model that I uploaded into Second Life. Uh, it's based on uh, x-ray crystallographic data that's available at uh, the RCSB. Here it is, rcsb.org. Uh, it's uh, from structure 4N8T. And uh, coincidentally, that's a structure that uh, one of my uh, that my collaborator George and uh, his student uh, published. Um, this is a heme molecule with a nitric oxide NO attached to it. So if we just look at uh, the heme part of it, you see it's an iron atom in orange. You see it's surrounded by a square of four nitrogen atoms. And then there's supporting scaffolding of carbon atoms. Um, I haven't drawn double bonds in, but essentially this uh, molecule is aromatic, basically uh, is planar. Uh, there is conjugation of double bonds all the way around this ring. Uh, and it satisfies the Hubble rule, uh, 4n plus 2 electrons. Does that matter for today's talk? No, not really, but what it does mean is that there is extensive delocalization of electron density around the main part of the ring. Other features of the um, heme are that there are two residues that have carbox carboxylate groups attached at uh, one end, and these can be um, used for hydrogen bonding to uh, proteins to help orient this uh, planar uh, unit in the molecule. On the other end, as you can see, there's only ethyl groups and methyl groups. So the other end is fairly nonpolar. So the iron likes to have six things attached. I've only shown five. In the actual protein, there would be a another group 
that is linked to the protein in this vacant sixth site. So that's a heme. And then specifically, it's a heme NO unit. Uh, my molecules that I've uh, uploaded, if you click on them, then uh, you can get a note card from me that um, talks about um, where the structure came from and a few words about what the structure represents. So I've done that for every uh, single um, structure um, for this talk. Um, so, moving on. Here are some examples of the active sites from uh, some metalloproteins. And I don't want to give the impression that uh, heme is the only metal-containing active site in a protein. Um, here's an example of an iron sulfur cluster. Uh, this one is used for uh, storing electrons um, for other sites to uh, take advantage of. And there are um, iron sulfur clusters in molecules uh, such as nitrogenase uh, that takes N2 from the atmosphere and turns it into um, ammonia uh, for nitrogen fixing. What I'm showing you today is going to focus more on uh, the heme group. So uh, let's see, this guy up here is a heme from a cytochrome P450. Here's a heme from a hemoglobin and a myoglobin, and here's a heme from a catalase. And uh, the heme themselves, the flat iron porphyrin, the organic part of the heme is a porphyrin, uh, is the same pretty much uh, from structure to structure. You'll notice there's some details uh, that are different, especially in terms of how the carboxylates are oriented. Uh, and a big detail is what is in the coordination site below the heme. I'm going to call that the proximal site. For the cytochrome P450 and things like uh, neuronal nitric oxide synthase, you have a cysteine. And uh, the cysteine is a protein. It's got a sulfur donor. And um, this uh, cysteine unit uh, would be part of the larger uh, protein polymer. And I'll show you examples of those later. Hemoglobin, myoglobin, um, and some peroxidases have a a histidine unit. It's basically, uh, it's got an imidazole ring. That's this five-membered ring uh, with two nitrogens not beside each other um, that's in that last space. And then um, something like a catalase might have a uh, tyrosine, which has a, a benzene ring with an OH, and here the OH is deprotonated. Um, and the oxygen is directly attached to the iron. So uh, these, these molecules are ubiquitous in uh, biochemistry, but they're not in every single protein that's out there. So a couple of things. Uh, I've mentioned catalases, excuse me, catalases and peroxidases. These things uh, catalyze the reactions of H2O2. H2O2 is... Uh, made naturally in your body uh, you basically um, you basically um, make it um, as a consequence of your metabolic activity uh, it is a strong oxidant and so having it in your body in the wrong place at the wrong time can be a very big problem uh, it would contribute to oxidative stress uh, in your uh, metabolism. Uh, and that can uh, lead to um, cell wall um, degradation or uh, mutations or um, just, just generally bad stuff happening. So there's two ways of getting rid of this stuff. Uh, and one way is simply to use a catalase. And you've all got catalases inside of you. Uh, and catalase will take the um, two molecules of hydrogen peroxide uh, and convert them into water and uh, good old dioxygen. Uh, dioxygen in the wrong place at the wrong time is not much better, but at least it can diffuse and perhaps get onto a hemoglobin and be uh, transported um, somewhere else where it can be of use. The other thing that we can do with per um, 
with uh, hydrogen peroxide is use a peroxidase. And a peroxidase actually takes advantage of the oxidizing power of hydrogen peroxide to make some other chemical transformation happen. Here, AH2 is some molecule. Uh, it's got two hydrogens on it, and those hydrogens end up becoming attached to the oxygens that came from H2O2. And then you're left with some molecule A. Uh, in other uh, uses of this uh, peroxidase, enzyme, you could have A with a double bond O attached to it as well. Okay, so basically it's an enzyme that can oxidize some substrate which will uh, be used uh, in some other biochemical process a little bit later. So um, talking about catalases and uh, peroxidases. So essentially what we have here is the active site that you would expect to see with a catalase and the active site you would expect to see with a peroxidase. Notice that the uh, catalase has a uh, tyrosyl unit attached to the iron. Also notice that I'm representing the four nitrogens of the heme group by the vertices on uh, this square. So catalase has a tyrosyl unit. Uh, peroxidase has a histidine unit. That's very similar to hemoglobin and myoglobin. Hemoglobin and myoglobin also have histidine units down here below um, the uh, plane of the heme in what we're calling the proximal site. Where the action happens at these enzymes, though, is in what's called the distal site. And uh, both of these have histidines that are close to where something would bind to the iron atom, but not too close. They're close enough so that hydrogen bonding can uh, help to orient whatever is attached to the iron when the iron uh, is, is doing its business. There's also Another hydrogen bonding, uh, um, basically a, a sp aspartic acid, I think, or an aspartate, um, or a um, arginine in the case of uh, peroxide. So these units up here with hydrogen bonding help to keep um, the substrates and uh, H2O2 in their uh, proper orientation for these enzymes to work. So catalase, catalase takes H2O2, turns it into water and um, dioxygen, O2. How does that work? Well, the first thing that has to happen is that the uh, H2O2, the hydrogen peroxide, has to bind to the iron. There it is, bound to the iron. And uh, the histidine and the um, aspartate or arginine, hydrogen bond to both ends, as you can see, there's a hydrogen bond there and a hydrogen bond there. Bo they bond to both ends of the H2O2 unit. What happens next? Well, um, the combined action of being bound to the iron and having all this other hydrogen bonding encourages a bond to form between uh, the oxygen that's further away from the iron and this hydrogen. The uh, other thing that the other thing that happens is that the oxygen-oxygen bond breaks. So we end up with a water molecule because now both hydrogens are attached to that uh, oxygen, and then this unusual iron double bond O. It's an iron plus four. Looking at that, it's got an iron plus four uh, oxidation state. That's a very oxidizing form of iron. Usually iron two and iron three plus are the forms that you would encounter. Iron four plus would be, is a very rare form. Um, and that's not all. This structure is uh, called compound one. Um, it has 
another oxidizing equivalent because we have removed another electron from the heme itself. So somewhere from the uh, what we'll call the pi system, these delocalized electrons around uh, the ring of the heme, there's one missing. The upshot is that uh, this form of the molecule can um, remove two electrons from something else in a uh, single reaction. And that's what happens next. So what happens is that once we get into this state, another H2O2 comes in, uh, electrons are ripped off of it, essentially, uh, and we form an oxygen, or uh, electrons are ripped off of it, um, the hydrogens go away as H plus and essentially protonate um, the oxygen that's attached to the iron. And so you're left with uh, water and dioxygen. Okay. The little star represents where those oxygens end up. So the O2, all the oxygens in there came from that second H2O2. Okay. So this compound one, it's a very powerful oxidant. Uh, it took a long time to um, um, isolate and um, be observable, um, and you know, but it's pretty well established now that uh, this pathway or this uh, intermediate in this pathway is a real thing. Uh, so what I can show you, there we go. Um, I'm going to show you some hor uh, horseradish peroxidase uh, fairly soon. Um, here we have here we have a heme group that is in the compound one state. I seem to be getting mixed up with some other thing. Let me move that out of the way. Okay, so here we have um, a heme group. It's in the compound one state. Um, this is a single chain of a protein. So um, the blue starts the blue starts right here. There's one end of the blue. And this spaghetti and uh, spirals and sheet is one single polymer. It goes uh, nitrogen, carbon, carbon, nitrogen, carbon, carbon, nitrogen, carbon, carbon. carbon with other things hanging off of those atoms uh, to provide functionality. So anyway, it's one uh, single chain. You can um, follow it uh, in an unbroken line from start to finish. Along the way, you'll notice it looks broken. It looks broken uh, here, but it's not because I've actually put uh, the histidines in explicitly. So this histidine, you can tell it's histidine because it's got a five-membered ring with two nitrogens in it. This histidine um, is uh, part of uh, the chain up here. This particular histidine that I'm showing you right now is one of those histidines that helps to orient the H2O2 in the active site pocket. Here we have the iron oxo unit. Uh, of the compound one, and in the bottom, you can actually see another histidine. I didn't draw a bond there, but there is one. And then again, you can see the gap in the spiral where the amino acids um, um, are not shown because I've explicitly put the atoms in for this particular part. Uh, there's calcium in here, and none of these proteins, um, I've shown the water. There's water like everywhere in all of these uh, proteins. In fact, the calciums are bonded to six waters in the structure. Uh, there's also acetate coming from uh, the conditions used to crystallize this. And so uh, this is an x-ray crystal structure. Uh, so it's pretty well established that this compound one uh, state is a thing. Uh, so you know it's pretty well um, pretty well established in the literature. So, horseradish peroxidase is also uh, 
produced locally. Uh, you know, I am uh, near St. Louis and Malincroft, I'm sorry, um, Milliport Sigma uh, is a major company here and uh, the area grows horseradish. Uh, so horseradish peroxidase can be um, isolated uh, from uh, local materials. Okay. Okay, next slide. I've talked about hydrogen bonding. I just want to talk about that um, a little bit more. Um, so um, hydrogen bonding is basically um, is, is basically a intermolecular force. Uh, if you think of things like normal um, um, CH bonds or carbon-carbon bonds, uh, a they, they arise from sharing of electrons between two atoms. Um, a hydrogen bond is basically an electrostatic type of bond. Uh, if you look at an oxygen atom, it has a very strong attraction for electrons. Uh, and hydrogen has a somewhat weaker uh, um, attraction for electrons. So when the two are attached to each other, electrons tend to spend most of their time around the oxygen atoms, and they tend to neglect spending time around the hydrogen. That ends up giving the oxygen a net permanent negative charge and the hydrogen a net permanent positive charge. Well, these um, dipoles in the uh, these molecules end up attracting each other. So in fact, a water molecule has water has two lone pairs, and each of those represents two concentrations of negative charge. It's got two OH bonds. Each hydrogen represents a positive charge. So a, a water molecule can hydrogen bond in all four uh, directions, essentially along um, its its tetrahedral um, uh, shape. Okay. So, what is the strength of hydrogen bonding? Well, it's like one tenth to one twentieth of something like a carbon carbon bond, I guess. So um, each hydrogen bond is not particularly strong, and that's a good thing because if they were really, really strong, the bonding would be irreversible. Uh, hydrogen bonding is a feature of DNA. Um, if you uh, think of the rungs in DNA, um, each rung, the sides are held together by either three hydrogen bonds or two hydrogen bonds. Uh, each rung isn't held together by extremely strong forces, but when you have a hundred or a thousand of these rungs, they, they add up uh, and you know keep the DNA quite stable. Um, just unstable enough to be unzipped and allowed to uh, react when appropriate. Here's my slide on the horseradish peroxidase. Uh, basically, here's a uh, here's a uh, view of the active site that I uh, just uh, showed you. It's structure 1HCH from the um, RCSB PDB. Uh, basically, it's from uh, that uh, particular structure. Uh, I won't go into the chemistry too much, uh, but essentially, horseradish peroxidase can uh, take substrates and oxidize them. Organic substrates can be oxidized. Uh, one favorite one that people have is camphor, and then it can be turned into uh, a ketone. So um, horseradish peroxidase, because it's so available, it finds its way into commercial products, finds its way into a lot of different studies. So it's one of my favorite heme-containing enzymes. Another favorite, because I enjoy being alive, is uh, hemoglobin. Uh, here are uh, here is some uh, content from um, the uh, PDB. Basically, um, PDB 101 has some uh, really nice information on um, uh, hemoglobin. And here you can see uh, uh, the heme group in one of the four subunits of a hemoglobin. Uh, you can see the histidine bound to the iron. Notice how the iron's not quite in the plane. Uh, 
And when an oxygen molecule, and this is the regular O2, it's not hydrogen peroxide, binds, then the um, iron pops back into the ring. Maybe it pops out on the other side a little bit. So hemoglobin is a tetramer. It's basically got, um, well, actually, it's got uh, an alpha subunit and a beta subunit. They're almost the same. Each contains a heme. And then uh, a pair of those subunits dimerizes with another pair. Uh, and you end up having a um, molecule. It looks like it's got a hole in it, but it's more um, kind of shaped uh, like a, mm, these blobs go together in, a, in more of a tetrahedral. Hemoglobin is an interesting molecule. Um, after the first oxygen binds to the first heme group, uh, it facilitates the binding of a second oxygen to another heme group, and then the third, and then the fourth. So each um, time an oxygen binds, the next oxygen binds um, more quickly. This is unusual in chemistry, usually when you have a system that does the same thing um, a bunch of times. Um, you know, the first instance is the easiest, and then it gets harder and harder. So I made a model. I brought a model in. This is a, uh, this is a uh, hemoglobin um, um, nitric oxide complex, 4N8T. Uh, and if we zoom in on it, what we see are the heme groups. It's a little bit limited in the color palette I could use. Sorry about that. Uh, the hemes each have a nitric oxide, but you can kind of see the bent geometry that an NO or a um, O2 would adopt. And this molecule was uh, created by exposing regular hemoglobin uh, to nitrite. Uh, and here we have uh, two um, ions of nitrite, uh, NO2 minus. There should not be a bond in between them, but essentially uh, these nitrites uh, occupy the center of uh, this particular structure. An interesting feature of this structure is this, uh, is this NO, iron NO angle. Uh, it turns out from um, this, this study that... Uh, it was found that the iron NO angle uh, depends on how you introduce the NO. So there's two ways. Uh, one, you can take hemoglobin and allow nitric oxide NO gas to diffuse into it, uh, and you'll get reproducibly uh, one angle iron NO. Um, if you use this nitrite method uh, to produce the nitric oxide, you get reproducibly a different bond angle there. And uh, the bond angles are different because of the effect of um, the protein. And here you can see the uh, different uh, alpha and beta subunit um, uh, specifically. I think uh, um, an alpha beta pair would be orange and purple. I'm sorry, um, green and purple. And another pair is uh, yellow and blue. Okay, so. Um, Lesson to be learned from this protein is that is that what's happening at the um, metal center here, um, the iron in this case the um, iron NO, um, is not something that can be reproduced without the protein uh, being uh, present. If you just take heme and do this chemistry, there's only one iron NO angle. You might also ask, uh, is there interconversion of the two? I believe you have to heat up the uh, protein past uh, where it kind of decomposes to get these two to interconvert. But uh, clearly, one of them has to be a kinetic product, and one of them has to be a thermodynamic product. OK. Going back to the top. So hydrogen bonding, as we said, is a thing. Myoglobin is another protein. Uh, hemoglobin takes oxygen from your uh, collected in your lungs, passes it through the bloodstream, and hands it off to myoglobin. Uh, and myoglobin 
uh, takes uh, the oxygen from hemoglobin and distributes it uh, within the tissues. Uh, myoglobin basically looks like one of these subunits, like one of the colors. So it's a smaller um, molecule than uh, hemoglobin. And, you know, the bonding in hemoglobin and myoglobin have to be just strong enough for the oxygen to make it from your lungs to your tissues and then be transferred to the myoglobin and, and then, um, you know, to allow the oxygen to um, escape and be used in metabolic processes. So it's all very finely balanced how, um, how strongly these things bond. Um, Part of this is the hydrogen bonding. You can see um, there is uh, ability of uh, oxygen to hydrogen bond. Um, things like carbon monoxide, which is a poison for hemoglobin and myoglobin, um, they, carbon monoxide doesn't do the hydrogen bonding nearly as much. So, question that arises at this point, how do we know structure? Well, one answer is x-ray crystallography, and that's probably the most popular method, uh, most common method. But there are other methods, neutron diffraction. Uh, of course, you need a neutron source, like a reactor or something, to do neutron re uh, diffraction. Um, and a newer one called cryo-electron microscopy. Uh, and this latter one is really useful because it doesn't always require crystalline samples. And so I think uh, cryo-electron microscopy is going to be a technique that is going to be very useful in the future for determining protein structures, important protein structures, um, in cases where we can't get crystals. Okay. Uh, there's also magnetic resonance um, methods. Uh, and when you think magnetic resonance, often people think about imaging. Uh, but really, I'm talking about more of the NMR technique, nuclear magnetic resonance. Uh, it's not radioactive or anything like that. Um, it's just atoms have nuclei. Right, so the word nuclear is just an adjective there. Um, you can think of NMR methods as being radio wave phosphorescence uh, phenomenon. Essentially, you have a sample, you can hit it with a bunch of radio waves all at once, and um, then for a few seconds afterwards, you might um, detect, I was going to say here, but let's use the word detect, um, radio waves coming out. And from the intensity versus time plot of the radio waves that come out, uh, you can infer, after Fourier transform, of course, some um, details about the structure of uh, compounds. Uh, for uh, proteins, um, you can do uh, two-dimensional, three-dimensional methods, uh, way out of the scope of this talk, but you can uh, figure out um, which atoms are close to each other, and therefore deduce features of uh, the structure. Um, a few words about X-ray crystallography. Uh, it is basically um, it basically rests on uh, interference patterns. Uh, I don't have Bragg's law up here, but uh, Bragg's law is important. Um, how this works? Think of an X-ray beam coming into a surface. Okay. And the X-ray beam could bounce off a top layer of a surface or a bottom layer of the surface. Well, um, in the incident light, the um, X-ray beam, uh, all of the uh, waves are um, in phase with each other. Um, as, they, as the two beams coming out of the sample travel different distances, they're no longer guaranteed to be in phase with each other. If they happen to be in phase with each other, you get a thing, property called constructive interference, and then you know you will see a bright spot at some position where you know there's a large concentration of detectable X-rays. Um, the other limiting type of interference is destructive interference, where the peaks and the troughs line up. There we go, where the peaks and the troughs line up. Uh, and so they cancel each other out, leaving dead space. You don't detect any x-rays. So essentially what happens with a crystal is a bit more complex. Uh, you can think of an x-ray beam coming in and then 
uh, being diffracted from a crystal. Since a crystal is a three-dimensional diffraction grating, what you end up with is a three-dimensional pattern of spots um, around the crystal. And this pattern of spots depends on the angle that the X-ray beam comes in. So essentially what we do is we take, um, we do the experiment shown here. Um, take an X-ray beam, shoot it at a uh, crystal, and measure the positions and intensities of uh, the spots in three-dimensional space. Um, then you rotate the crystal a little bit, um, do another measurement, and you might take uh, several thousand of these uh, measurements uh, to build up a data set, and from that data set you can uh, deconvolute the map and make a model of um, whatever uh, makes up that crystal. In this case, uh, in this talk, we're talking about proteins. So modern X-ray diffractometry, so essentially um, here's a single crystal uh, X-ray uh, diffractometer. Um, there's a powder X-ray uh, diffractometer. That's just what the instrumentation uh, looks like. And the crystal growth part is really deserves some mention here. Um, it's an art to grow uh, crystals, especially of proteins. They are not guaranteed to give you um, crystals. I was able to find some nice uh, photos from NASA. Here's um, Commander Alexander uh, Gerst as uh, he is, I think he is, setting up uh, proteins to be crystallized in space. Um, Crystallization under zero gravity conditions uh, evidently uh, works really, really well. Here are some uh, crystals that were actually grown in space. Okay, uh, and essentially, the popular method uh, used to grow protein crystals uh, is essentially where you uh, take like a drop of your sample and then you invert it over um, a small cup that's got a solution in it that will tend to capture water. So it's essentially like a drying agent. And uh, you know you wouldn't just set up one of these little droplets. You might set up uh, almost 100. This is a 96 well plate um, um, container. So you might set up uh, 96 of these. What you want are little crystals, little single crystals, uh, maybe 200 microns on the side. What you don't want are things that uh, are twinned. Those types of crystals are harder to um, process the data. You, and you can do it, uh, especially with modern computers and the like, but it's just, just harder. You know, ideally, you just want one nice uh, crystal. All it takes is one crystal for you to be able to get good um, data. What do you do with the data? Well, after processing, you essentially have a snapshot of the molecular structure. If you have a high quality crystal structure, then you've got um, knowledge of where all of the atoms are. Uh, we have made tremendous advances in X-ray crystallography in the past uh, three decades. Now, this is very useful when your other methods um, aren't enough. Uh, Sporting methods are nice, but uh, it's obviously nicer to have like a snapshot. Uh, and I don't want to give you the impression that, you know, having an extra crystal structure is the, uh, makes it um, definitive that you know what your compound is. There are a lot of assumptions that go into uh, figuring out a structure, and sometimes those assumptions are wrong and can give you um, results that uh, need further interpretation. There are a number of um, publicly accessible databases uh, for small molecules, for minerals, for, um, and for protein uh, crystallography. And just about everything I talked to you about today is coming from the, uh, the RCSB um, site. Uh, once, once you've got the data, um, you know, if you're a member of the public, um, you can use things like JMOL or Chimera or PyMOL to actually view the data, uh, you know, JMOL, PyMOL, Chimera. You can even just um, type in the 
um, identifier from the RCSB PDB, and it'll just download um, the uh, data by itself. So here's an example, the, the 4D1N, and uh, that's a neuronal uh, nitric oxide synthase. Um, you know, what you get when you just open it up in JMOL is where all the atoms are. And after some clicking around and, um, you know, some playing, you can get it to look uh, like a nicer structure. Uh, as you can see, the um, at the, the view of every atom in the structure is not really necessary um, because uh, if you represent some of the action happening in the structure by cartoons, then you can focus on uh, what's really important. So, um, you know, basically um, moving on to some other examples, heme thiolate proteins, I mentioned cysteine in the uh, proximal site, uh, heme thiolate proteins are uh, incredibly important. They do a variety of things, both in the body and uh, commercially. And I was going to talk to you about just a couple. Cytochrome P450, I've already uh, showed you uh, that structure. The P450 comes from um, the um, wavelength of light. Um, you know, that uh, the carbon monoxide complex of this thing shows. Uh, it's, it's basically got a um, maximum absorbance that frequency. I'm also going to show you a nitric oxide uh, synthase. Okay, so three things that these guys can do is they can put an oxygen on some uh, substrate. Uh, and what we'll see uh, for neuronal nitric oxide synthase is that uh, the molecule will take um, an amino acid L-arginine and turn it into uh, L-citrulline um, by breaking off a nitrogen and shoving a um, oxygen on it to make NO nitric oxide. Okay. And there's, there's plenty of other things that these molecules do. Okay, so cytochrome P450. Uh, you've got cytochrome P450s in you. Uh, they're in your liver. They help do things like um, they help do things like uh, detoxify organic compounds. Uh, for example, say you've been exposed to some benzene, benzene C6H6. Um, a cytochrome P450 could take uh, some benzene and uh, turn it into phenol, which is C6H5OH. The OH group improves the solubility and allows your uh, kidneys to uh, filter out the molecule and uh, you can urinate it out. Uh, P450 is a very important molecule. And I think I've got examples of a cytochrome P450 somewhere. No, I have the horseradish uh, peroxidase uh, instead. Okay. So moving along. So um, one thing, one thing that we've seen before is compound one. Compound one is very um, highly um, oxidizing. And what it can do is grab a hydrogen atom from some other uh, molecule to make essentially an OH. Well, when this happens, say your benzene turns into a phenyl radical after it loses its hydrogen atom. The phenyl radical is particularly reactive and will just make off with the whole OH from uh, the iron and turn into phenol. This is why it's called a rebound mechanism because the consequence of um, the iron oxo stealing a hydrogen from the substrate is that the substrate comes back and steals the whole OH. Uh, very classic uh, type, type of chemistry. Here we get into the uh, neuronal uh, nitric oxide synthase. Um, this is a uh, model of the of the uh, NNOS that uh, that I have here. It's the 4D1N, uh, and this one actually has a 
um, L-arginine mimic in the active site. Okay, so um, here's the heme. Uh, to save time in uh, processing this uh, structure, I left all of the um, cofactors, as they are called, uh, since they're not part of the protein chain, in orange. Okay, and there is a heme group over here. There is another heme group over here. There's the um, iron, and uh, both of these subunits are identical, so we'll go back to the first one. The, um, and in fact, there is this, you can see this longer chain out here um, that um, is poised above the iron atom of the uh, active site. Okay, I'll uh, also point out this is a tetrahydro biopterin molecule and it can store up to four hydrogen atoms which means four H pluses and four electrons and uh, this would be part of the um, electron and proton transfer chain that would um, allow the heme group to the detail of this active sites reproduced over here so what I have over here is an electrostatic map of the pocket of the heme. You can see the heme is in there. There's, there's the iron atom. I made it shiny because I like shiny things. What you can see right here would be one of the carboxylate groups. Uh, red indicates area of negative charge. I believe there's a hydrogen bond happening um, over here. Um, is it negative? No, I'm sorry. Red is positive charge, so um, that's where what's that's why this uh, hydrogen bond is happening. That's why the uh, iron down here um, is is red. This atom is supposed to be a sulfur atom from the um, thiolate that uh, is in the proximal site, and above we can see our L-arginine mimic. It binds more strongly than L-arginine does in uh, this particular molecule because uh, it's got a slightly changed um, end in the active site and then a uh, more strongly hydrogen bonding um, end at, uh, far from the active site. So this would be a molecule that would deactivate nitric oxide synthase. And there's our uh, tetrahydrobiopterin as well. And you can see some of the more uh, spaghetti um, parts of the uh, protein that are holding everything in place. Right? One, thing, one thing that is nice is that um, through the colors on the electrostatic map, as molecules make their approach to the heme group, you can actually see um, how um, the molecules are directed to um, being in the right place at the right time. It's also an acetate down here uh, from the um, crystallization conditions. Uh, in all of these structures, I haven't shown explicitly the hydrogen atoms because uh, that just adds complexity that doesn't um, help with the um, um, seeing, seeing what the active uh, sites are doing. Okay. Uh, nitric oxide, of course, is very important. Um, it, the uh, Nobel Prize for Physiology or Medicine uh, was given in 1998 for the discovery that nitric oxide has a uh, biological role. Uh, it can do things like uh, it's a neurotransmitter. Um, it's a signaling agent that um, helps control physiological blood pressure. It's even secreted by white blood cells. Uh, since it's a nasty molecule, uh, it uh, would act like bleach if you're a white blood cell um, throwing something that acts like bleach on a um, bacterium uh, is probably uh, part of your job description. Uh, so essentially, it's produced in the body, as I've been saying, by um, L-arginine. In our mimic, we had a ring up in this part instead of just the L-arginine. 
uh, an L-arginine gets oxidized. There's an OH that um, attaches itself to one of those ends because of the action of the um, heme group. Um, and then uh, further along, we basically um, remove remove uh, a nitrogen. There we go. We remove a nitrogen and it comes off as NO. Notice how there's only two nitrogens in that unit or there used to be three over here. Okay, so uh, this is just a two-dimensional representation of the active site uh, with hydrogen bonding. Uh, so you can see um, you know, what the pocket of the protein looks like uh, on the inside. Okay, uh, just mentioned that's a dimer as well. There's, it's a dimer of dimers, in fact. There's a small subunit and a larger subunit, uh, and then those two dimerizes. Okay, and I've mentioned all of these things. So, um, not only is NO produced by a heme-containing enzyme, it's sensed by a heme-containing uh, enzyme. Uh, and once it's sensed, it um, basically gives you guan uh, guanidyl cyclase, I think that's what that's called, uh, um, at which um, is another signaling molecule that uh, downstream will cause uh, the blood pressure to go down. Essentially, uh, there's a muscle tissue that surrounds arteries, and uh, it's called smooth muscle tissues. And uh, when um, it receives the uh, signal from nitric oxide to uh, relax, uh, the uh, blood pressure will go down because there's more space in the uh, blood, blood vessels. Okay. So what exactly does it do? Well, it basically, um, it basically uh, starts this cascade. Uh, one thing that uh, one thing nitric oxide does, uh, you know, for, for blood pressure, when you think of um, um, drugs uh, such as uh, Viagra, for example, um, that um, the action of Viagra has to do with um, uh, blood pressure with uh, relaxing uh, smooth muscle tissue or not relaxing smooth muscle tissue in um, certain places in the body. Uh, and the more nitric oxide you've got uh, in the right place at the right time, the more physiological effect it'll have. Well, there's two ways of getting nitric oxide levels to increase. Uh, one way is to make more nitric oxide. The other way is to stop the nitric oxide that is being made from decomposing. So, uh, you know, basically in the body, there are physiological mechanisms that get rid of nitric oxide once it's uh, done its job. And drugs such as Viagra um, basically um, put, put a damper on the um, cycling or uh, processing of uh, nitric oxide. So basically it plugs the drain, let's say, and um, you know allows each NO to have a longer lasting effect. So some last thoughts. Heme's really important. Uh, it's not the only cofactor that you find in the body, um, but it's an important one. It um, has a lot of different uh, functions in enzymes. Uh, you know, essentially, essentially, it's got a lot of flexibility for uh, such a molecule. Um, you know, what's in this uh, site number six, as, as, as I'll call it, the proximal site, um, plays a huge role. What um, the hydrogen bonding network hap it does in the uh, distal site, as well as the proximal site, plays a huge role in determining um, its chemistry. So, um, you know, basically, uh, this site here would allow you to uh, do a 3D print of a heme molecule or a, a hemoglobin protein. It's basically the files you would need if you had a printer. Um, and, you know, you could make yourself a little blob of uh, hemoglobin. Okay, so again, acknowledgements. I started out with acknowledgements. Uh, I've got some useful references uh, here. Uh, I want to thank everyone for their um, attention. Again, thank uh, um, NSF uh, 
in my uh, school for um, their, their support. So essentially, that's what I have for you today, and I hope you've enjoyed uh, today's talk. Thank mm -hmm. you.